is called um, Fast, Furious, and Insecure, Passive Keyless Entry and Start Systems in Modern Supercars. And it will be presented by Leonard Wouters, and it's joint work with uh, Edward Marin, Tomer Ashur, Benedict Gierlich, and Bart Prenier. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, some of you might have seen this talk before, but still uh, pay attention because at the end there's a small surprise. So the goal of this research was to figure out how secure a modern day passive keyless entry and start system is. Now the way you would use one of these systems is you have the key fob in your pocket, you approach the car and it automatically unlocks. So when you're close to the vehicle, it sends a challenge to your key fob, the key fob computes a cryptographic response and sends it back to the car. If the response is correct, the car unlocks. And the same procedure is repeated to start the vehicle. Now if we take a Model S key fob and we open it up, um, this is the backside of the PCV. There's not that many interesting parts. So there's a uh, low frequency antenna, a UHF antenna, and a transmitter chip. The front is a bit more interesting because you can see that there's this one black package that's staring at you. And in this case, that's a Texas Instruments TMS 37F128. Now if you take an X-ray of this package, you can actually see that there's two dies inside, inside or two distinct chips. So one of them is the TMS 37126 transponder, which in this case will perform all of the cryptographic operations and it stores the cryptographic key. Secondly, there's an MSP430 microcontroller, which is a simple general purpose microcontroller that runs all of the application level code. The general purpose microcontroller can interact with the transponder over a SPI interface. Now usually when you do a project like this, um, you want to get access to some of these chips. But in this case, that's the first hurdle you have to overcome because Texas Instruments doesn't sell these chips to you unless you want to get a large quantity and unless you sign NDAs. Now luckily, um, COSIC is a very international research group and I have a lot of international colleagues. So in this case, my Chinese colleagues helped me to get these chips from Taobao. Once you get the chips, uh, you notice that they use a very uncommon package type. So we started off by designing our own breakout board which makes it easier to connect to it. In this case, the chip is um, only the transponder, so without the integrated microcontroller. Again, the same issue applies for the data sheets. You can't get them without signing NDAs, and as researchers, we of course don't like signing NDAs. There is some public information, but the information that is out there is very inconsistent, so you can easily find multiple pinouts for the same chip, which makes it very annoying if you're trying to connect to it. My initial goal was to connect it to an Arduino so I could send SPI commands to it and see what the functionality of the chip is, basically. So once you figure out how to connect it on a breadboard, it looks somewhat like this. And as you can see, we have an Arduino on the left and it communicates with SPI uh, to the transponder. Usually SPI looks like this. So you have a clock line, you have a data line for data going from the master to the slave and a data line for data going from the slave to the master. In this case, the Arduino will be the master and the transponder is the slave. Texas Instruments decided to add a fourth line, which, is, which they call the busy line. And as you can imagine, it's used by the transponder to indicate to the master when it is ready to receive the next byte of data. Now, as we don't have a data sheet, we have to figure out ourselves um, which SPI commands exist. Um, but in this slide, you can also see the general structure of what one of these packets looks like. So they always start with a length byte, which basically indicates how many bytes will follow this byte. Then there's a command byte and one or more data bytes. The transponder can also respond with some more data. So we figured out that this busy line is also being used to throw errors. So the transponder will hold this line high or low for an extended period of time if an error occurs. So for example, if the command value is incorrect or if the length value is incorrect. And as it turns out, you can use these two observations to automatically recover all of the available commands and the number of bytes of input you have to provi provide for this command. So in this way, we figured out that these commands are available on a chip, and these are the ones we thought were interesting. So there's two commands that perform DST40, which is an old 40-bit cipher. I'll talk more about that one a bit later on. Then there's also an, an unknown DST function, which also uses a 40-bit key, but produces a different output to a given input. 
Now, when I started this project, I was expecting to find an 80-bit cipher, so I made the assumption that maybe they combined two 40-bit ciphers in the hope of getting an 80-bit secure one. So I reverse engineered this cipher by providing inputs to it and observing the output, making assumptions on what the internal structure is doing, because we know how DST40 works, then verifying these assumptions and until we reverse engineered the cipher. Now later on I figured out they weren't actually using this, so I spent one month of my time for no reason. So this is what, uh, again, what the key fob looks like, and they have some easily accessible debug pads. And as it turns out, the JTAG fuse of the MSP430 microcontroller is not blown, so you can dump the program memory and open it in a disassembler. In this case, we use binary ninja with an MSP430 plugin, and we start off by doing what is called static analysis. So we try to identify pieces of code that we think are interesting. And in the case of an MSP430, and also for most other microcontrollers, what you want to do first is look at the interrupt vector table. And this, in this case, it's stored at the end of flash. And it basically tells you which pieces of code are being run when an interrupt occurs. So in the case of a key fob, which code is run when you press a button on the key fob. Secondly, special function registers are very interesting. And in this case, the SPI transmit and receive buffers. Because we're interested to learn which SPI commands are being used in this key fob. So what we basically do is we identify the interesting code and we note down the addresses. And then we can go over to dynamic analysis in which we set breakpoints on the microcontroller and then use the key fob as you would do otherwise. So we set a breakpoint at the start of the SPI routine. We then try to unlock the vehicle and when the breakpoint triggers, we can dump the memory. In this way, we can see which data is being sent and received over the SPI interface. Now, after doing this a few times with a real car, we figured out that they were only using command 86, which we had earlier discovered is DST40. So what is DST40? DST40 was introduced back in 2000 by Texas Instruments. It uses a 40-bit key, and it was reverse engineered for the first time in 2005. Back then, it was mainly used for immobilization systems in vehicles. It was also used in a payment system. This is what the cipher looks like. So you have a 40-bit key register at the bottom in an LFSR configuration. At the top, there's a 40-bit challenge register. And every round, two bits of output get produced that get clocked back into the challenge register. The entire cipher is run for 200 rounds. Then after these 200 rounds, the 24 least significant bits, which are marked in red on the slide, are returned as the response. The only thing you have to remember from this slide is that there's a 40-bit key, a 40-bit challenge, and then a 24-bit response. So the response is shorter than the input. So we know that the key fob is using an old cipher, which we can probably break, but we still have to figure out how the key fob and the car are communicating with each other. Now, most modern-day key fobs, there's actually two distinct systems that you can distinguish. There's a remote keyless entry system, which you use when you press a button on the key fob, and in this case, there's one-way communication from the key fob to the car. We also reverse the remote keyless entry part, um, which is described in the paper, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that part. Because the passive keyless entry and start system is more interesting because it also allows you to drive off with the vehicle. In this case, there's two-way communication. So there will be ultra-high frequency communication from the key fob to the vehicle. These signals are rather easy to receive because there's a lot of nice tools out there that you can use. In this case, I use the yardstick one. For low frequency, the story is a bit different as the tooling is not as well developed. Um, but in this case, we decided to use a Proxmark 3. And um, because the modulation used by the vehicle is not actually implemented in the Proxmark 3, we had to write our own Verilog code in the FPGA, um, C code on the microcontroller, and I modified the hardware to boost the receiver range. This is what the signals look like. So the top signal is what the antenna of the Proxmark actually receives. Then the signal is routed to an amplification stage. Then there's an analog peak detect circuit, and then the FPGA will uh, output the bottom signal. Implementing this was a bit of a hassle, so I had to spend a few of my weekends like this in, around, in and around the vehicle. And basically the idea here is to have the antenna as close to the transmitting antennas of the car. So there's a transmitting antenna in the center cup holder, but there's also some antennas at the rear view mirrors. Now once you can receive um, ultra-high frequency and low-frequency signals, you can build a topical analyzer. 
So I have a simple Python script that interacts with both radios, and we can then use the car in a legitimate way, so unlock it with the key fob. Um, and by doing that with the real key fob and the real car, and doing it a few times, you can look at which messages stay constant, which change, and which parts change. And by doing it a few times and staring at um, the binary output, you can then figure out what the protocol looks like. So in this case, the, the car will send periodically, twice a second in this case, a message to the key fob. If the key fob is nearby, it will reply. And the reply is actually an obfuscated version of the previous packet. I'm not really sure why the obfuscation is here. And if you receive the message from two or three vehicles, you can easily figure out what the obfuscation is because it's simple bits, shifts, and byte swaps. When the car receives this reply, it will send the challenge to the key fob. Key fob computes a cryptographic response, and the car verifies it. If it's correct, the car unlocks. It's important to note here that the key fob will only reply if the car identifier in the packet is correct. So as an attacker, if you want to impersonate the car, you need to know the car identifier. But it's only two bytes. So we were first thinking of stealing the car without ever seeing the key fob. And the idea here was to send a random response. So the car sends you a challenge, you reply with a random response, and you hope to get lucky. As it turns out, after 97 days and about one guess a second, you will get lucky once, and you will be able to unlock the vehicle. Afterwards, during computations, you can get the second challenge response pair required to recover the key in about nine additional hours. But the nice thing about this attack is that it can be automated. Now, 97 days to steal a car is not really a practical attack, and we want to show that using 40-bit keys today is maybe not the best decision. So we wanted to build an efficient attack. Um, and as a reminder, we have a 40-bit challenge, a 40-bit key, and only a 24-bit response. So this means that for each of the 40-bit challenges, there's gonna be multiple keys that produce the same response. And this also means that you will need at least two challenge response pairs to recover the real key. Um, in this case, there is no mutual authentication in the challenge response protocol, so we can build a time memory trade-off table. And the idea here is that we fix one challenge, so we fix it once, and then for each possible value of the key, we compute the response. Afterwards, we group all of the keys that produce the same response to this fixed challenge. So we end up with a 5.4 terabyte lookup table, which has two to the 24 files, one for each response, and each of these files contains about two to the 16 keys. Now, how do we use this table? Um, in a real attack, you first have to get the car identifier. You then send your challenge to the key fob. You record the response, and you use this response to select a file from your lookup table. At that point, there's only two to the 16 keys left, so you send the second challenge to the key fob and brute force the remaining keys. So this takes about two seconds on a Raspberry Pi. Then we built this device. Um, so at the top, there's a simple USB power bank. Then there's a Raspberry Pi Model 3, which is the brains of the operation. And it's controlling the Proxmark 3 and Yardstick 1 radios. The way I use this in practice is I make a hotspot on my phone. The Raspberry Pi connects to the hotspot. I can SSH into the Raspberry Pi and start the tools. And the Raspberry Pi can use the same connection to reach out to the time memory trade-off table. Now, after figuring out these issues, we, of course, contacted um, the manufacturers. We started off by contacting Tesla. And we then quickly figured out that they actually bought the system from a company called Vectron. And as it turns out, they built similar systems using the same Texas Instruments chip for McLaren, Karma, and Triumph. Does anyone have a McLaren? <laughs> so, um, the initial report is almost two years ago already. Um, and after one year, uh, Tesla had a new key fob, which they put in, the new, key, uh, in uh, new vehicles being produced. And they also released some over-the-air software updates that people can enable. So they're not enabled by default, but you can enable them in the settings. One of them is basically two-factor authentication. So every time you start your vehicle, you have to enter a PIN code. The second is um, the ability to disable passive entry. And this is actually a nice feature because it will stop uh, relay attacks, which are very common in practice. Now, um, from doing this research, we can 
draws some conclusions. And most of the conclusions are pretty sad maybe to show in 2019 because I figured that everyone would have known this by now. But there's still manufacturers relying on proprietary cryptography. And there's manufacturers that rely on NDAs to make sure that their chips are secure. Um, there are car manufacturers, a lot of them, that rely on tier one or tier two suppliers to make secure products for them. And they might not know what they're buying. And there's also a lot of people that rely on the secrecy of their firmware to make a secure product. But in most cases, and especially in general purpose microcontrollers, there's always a way to get the firmware out. But maybe the most important conclusion is that Tesla got a lot of heat for using 40-bit keys. But the other car manufacturers, such as McLaren, Karma, and Triumph, they didn't respond at all. And Tesla fixed the issues. I have a few funny stories about McLaren specifically, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip them. But you can always come up to me after the talk and I'll be happy to elaborate. This is a video we made um, to show how the attack would work in practice. So I'll again explain how the attack works. Now, if you want to steal a Tesla Model S, it's not that difficult to find one. They all have to charge at some point, and they all do it in the same location. So I think the car has to charge for about 40 minutes, and most people will go to a nearby coffee shop or go for a walk while they wait for the car to charge. Now, as I mentioned before, as an attacker, um, what we need to communicate with the key fob is the car identifier. We can either brute force it, but walking up to the vehicle and sniffing it is a lot faster and easier. The output on top, uh, the terminal output, is recorded from my phone in this case. Then you have to send your challenge to the key fob. <laughs> Record the response, get the correct file from the lookup table, brute force the remaining keys, and in a few seconds, you have a perfect copy of the key fob. And at this point, you can easily unlock the vehicle. And you have to remember to unplug it before you drive off. <laughs> and because the same cryptographic key is being used to unlock the vehicle and start the vehicle, you can also drive off with it. So this is usually the point, the point where I would end this talk, but um, it's chess and I promised you something new. So I also had a look at the new key fob that Tesla made. <laughs> so as it turns out, they locked JTAG in this case, and the key fob is actually using DST80, so a new 80-bit cipher. But we found a way to trick it into doing DST40 with half of the 80-bit key. And we can actually make it do that on both half of the 80-bit of the key. So we could generate a second lookup table and use four seconds instead of two to make a copy of the key fob. Now there is a small downside to this attack because you have to be uh, shorter to the key fob because we're only using low frequency communication for this attack. Um, so the cars being produced today are already using a new, new key fob and uh, Tesla is releasing a software update and it's being rolled out since today that allows people to update the key fob um, from their car. So this is what the update looks like. And as you can see, um, I guess Tesla knew I was gonna present it today, so they even updated their chess game. Um, but the idea is that you will put the key fob close to the transmitting antennas and the car will uh, issue a fix to the key fob. And I think this is a pretty cool way of solving the issue. There will also be a, an, an article about the attack on, on Wired in a few minutes. So that's it for my talk, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you. 
you mentioned that you are using uh, the memory trade of tables, but with uh, them it is a problem that you never get 100% coverage. So my question is, what is the coverage of your tables? Sorry, could you repeat the last uh, one? What is the coverage of your time, time memory trade of tables? Because normally you never get 100% coverage if it is. Uh, so no, using the table, we reduce the key space to two to the 16. And then we need a second challenge response pair to get the actual value of the key. Yeah, that's a, so you are 100% 100 successful? On the five or six cars, I tried to unlock this worked, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there might be some edge cases where you're not successful, but nothing prevents you from sending a third or fourth challenge to the key fob. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again.